Welcome to the Coca Dota 250 Live presented by Solomon. We are just one hour away from the inaugural Coca Dota 250, where 176 runners are going to be embarking on an epic 255.8 mile journey from Black Canyon City to Flagstaff, Arizona. Yeah, I anyway, think yeah. some form of familiarity with the course is going to be important. Um, but in turn, you also have to have the fitness to to be able to sustain yeah. 250 plus miles. You know, like that undertaking, in my mind, is insane. And I think for a lot of people tuning in, thinking of traversing 250 plus miles, 255 miles on foot, is is crazy. Right. And it's an amazing adventure. And um, I think nothing replaces fitness, yep. right? But definitely having an understanding for the course is going to help, right? All right. One minute. But if you have worked, you have run, you have trained to get to this day, to get to the starting line. You made the decision. You are ready for adventure. You are ready for something epic, and we're going to give it to you today. You can just feel the excitement building here in the start corral. The energy yeah, yeah. is high, the <laughs> runners are excited to embark in what is bound to be yeah. an incredible journey. I count you down at 10, I want you to take a deep breath and step up to the starting line. The first steps of the inaugural Coca-Dona 250. I literally have goosebumps right now watching the start of this. Yeah. Matt, I can't stress enough just how hard this course is from start to finish, but the hardest part of the course is arguably the first 50K where the runners are going to have to climb nearly 10,000 feet around Lane Mountain before they make that descent into the Crown King Saloon. Drew and I got to that mile 30 aid station at the same time after that 20 mile stretch and like we just started talking and we like basically said the exact same thing to each other. We were like, fuck dude, like we're good at this. You know what I mean? Like, and that was gnarly. Like, the mid and the back of the Packers are f This is a race that starts in the desert, and in the first 50K, you climb 10,000 feet. There's not a lot of 50Ks out there that have that much climbing, and that's just the start of this thing. Just a little bit more. I don't think three liters was uh, enough. Gnarly water. Yeah, I got to that aid station and chugged a ton of water. And part of me was like, don't do that, don't do that. You're gonna throw your electrolytes off. But all I wanted yeah. was water. All the the watermelon and the hydration from that first aid station is you almost and I know I probably did a little bit, you kinda of gorge a little bit, you're like, oh, because it's just you've been so like ravaging for some water for so long. Thank you. Good job. Yes, good man. Go get him. Good job. In 50k, so like 33 miles, you've gained almost a quarter of your elevation for the course. You're dehydrated, you've had your longest stretch between aid stations, and people keep going. Like, people are dehydrated, and everyone got worked, but everyone without batting an eye is like, yep, 220 miles to go, let's keep on pushing. And people are running down that hill, just 10 minutes after being dehydrated, they're running down to Crown King. All right, Matt, so now the runners are coming down into Crown King after an absolutely brutal start to the race. That has got to feel good. This is going to be the first time they get to see their crew. The idea of traveling through these historic Arizona towns and linking them together was, I guess, my version of this Black Canyon Trail extension 
wanting to tie them all together, wanting to go longer distance here in Arizona and stringing together over 200 miles in a foot race. And I was fortunate enough to have a good friend, Anthony Culpepper, who I think in 2008 or 9, he hiked this great Western loop. A lot of the early brainstorming and back and forths was mostly me and Anthony when we would get together throughout the year. We would talk about it, we'd pull out maps, we would start to kind of scheme what it might look like. It eventually evolved into this idea uh, that became Cocodona and potentially Cocodona as its own trail as well that linked up these towns. You know, we've got the Arizona Trail, we've got some other concepts of long distance trails and we just figured, well, there's no one stopping us from creating our own iconic route. And so it, that's kind of where the idea was born. How do we link up these towns and connect these amazing places in Arizona? And we definitely, there was certain towns that we definitely wanted to include and there were certain trails that we wanted to include that are pre-existing. But other than that, it was a, we were just choosing our own adventure as we went along. My hope for this race is that it becomes a worldwide known event of endurance and that it somehow impacts and changes people in a positive way, not only the runners, but the spectators and crew and those communities that it travels through. And I want it to be a positive benefit for, for everyone involved, something that's, that's brutal, that's tough, that people can feel accomplished and they can really get a sense of what the heart of Arizona is all about. society like we're supposed to not do things that we're gonna fail at and that's why it's special that people were like inaugural year 255 miles probably more yeah let's try it <laughs> it's awesome Having an aid station in the courtyard of one of the oldest saloons in Arizona is, it's just, it's so perfect for Cocodona. It, it's like sets the tone, I think, for the race. The first 37 miles, I mean, epic climb, desert to pines. You get a glimpse of the San Francisco peaks in that first section, and then you hit up this historic town. I mean, it's kind of a microcosm of the whole event. As a, as a whole, and I think, I mean, if that was a race in and of itself, it would be pretty epic and pretty amazing for, I think, almost anyone. I love those little podunk towns in the middle of nowhere. You're like, there's a, there's a town up here in the middle of the mountains, and there's a bar, and everyone goes out and, you know, parties, has, has a good time, so. I've been up to Crown King several times through, like, doing the, the scramble race, and, um, I also just kind of knew the atmosphere that I was going to get. So as soon as I hit lane, I knew, okay, it's just a couple miles down this hill. I'm going to see my crew. It's going to be popping down there. And it was. You kind of get that, you know, resurgence. Um, I stopped. I just kept chugging liquids, slammed half a Bud Light. <laughs> this is how I ultra. <laughs> Would you like us to duct tape that to your hand? A wizard staff by the end of the but it was just oh, it was so good seeing everybody and just at that moment I knew I'm like okay just just enjoy it just take some time because you have another long stretch you know through the Bradshaws still to go so
leave on board to help oversee the event. Uh, you know, someone I put a lot of trust into to make sure the event is run safely and up to standard. My name's Steve Adderholt. I'm the race director of the Cocodona 250. What Jamil's vision to create was really to create this like ultra European style race, which you're going through these towns, you know, and the town embraces uh, and you get the history and the community around that. And this race has that. Uh, and I mean, he also described this as uh, a race that could be a pinnacle of that uh, across the world for ultra running. We definitely want to build it towards that. I think the first year though, I mean, that was his grand vision. The first year we were just like trying to put it together and hold it together and make it happen. I figured it would be cool for me to run it the first year and kind of put myself through this thing that we've created. Well, the sun is definitely up now. Just leaving Cottonwood Aid Station, mile 11 right now. All right, check in for mile 39, where we're above Crown King. Get last bit of light here, coming into mile 52 Battle Flat. Kind of to show that it's possible, and also for me to learn boots on the ground, what is it like to, to toe the line of this thing the first year, and just to have that perspective I think was important. Feeling so good. It's incredible out here. It's runnable again. And there was a great section through these dense pine forests back there. And now we're just cruising. The views are unreal. We've even got some fire scars over here, but yeah, feeling good. Trying to just take it easy, jog it out, and uh, hike. It makes sense. I knew that we had a lot of dirt road miles ahead, which I thought was great. And it turned out to be awesome, like running on the Senator Highway, incredible views at sunset, and you get to stretch your legs out a bit and kind of recover. I can definitely see runners being able to make up some time if they can kind of regroup mentally at Crown King, get up that next climb, have their composure, have a little bit of leg left in them. I think they can really make up some time here. running through these cool, beautiful forests, which we hadn't had quite yet. There's a little bit of forest running down into Crown King, but it was just a little bit different. And then just looking out once, once you break out of the trees and just seeing just like endless rolling, like endless mountain ranges as far as the eye can see, looking out towards the sun, which was kind of starting to set, just kind of makes for this perfect concoction of endorphins and whatever else was going on in my brain and my body that was just beautiful. The thing about this section of the course, you know, they've been in the Bradshaw Mountains, they're in the start of the Sonoran Desert, they went up into the Bradshaw Mountains, and now they're down in Prescott. This is the first time they're actually hitting a uh, town with paved roads. They've been on trails, single track, double track, and fire roads up until this point. I grew up in Prescott, like I grew up like as a kid, like exploring mines in the Bradshaw Mountains. And Prescott was the territorial capital of Arizona at one point, and it's really well known for the like the Whiskey Row, all these old saloons and bars. It's kind of a theme of this race in the first 80 miles. And then like I said, growing up in Prescott, like I live in Prescott now, you know, and it's like, I used to work on the vineyards in the Verde Valley and Jerome and um, cruising around like Clarkdale and Cornville and Page Springs and like, like, and then I think I, again, like Sedona is the only place I've never lived. So let's go back on Verstique, making his way into Whiskey Row. The first person to hit Prescott as part of the Cocodona 250. He's going to uh, get to Whiskey by, by midnight. To just the comfort level that that brings, you know what I mean? Like the security that that brings when you're like 
four in the morning, middle of the night, but to like feel like you know where you are, or like that advantage is real, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, just having Mike, Michael join the race, I think I just threw it out to him on a whim, like a few months before the race, I was like, hey, you wanna run this thing? <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, sure. He does apply himself and he does get prepped for things like this and he does want to succeed and do well in a lot of the things he does. He does it differently than I think most people, which I think is really appealing for a lot of us, like how he lives his life so authentically is really cool. And, um, you know, to see him just, you know, toe the line, he's got like this pair of like minimalist shoes that just beats into the ground and like doesn't want to carry anything. Like, yeah, it's kind of, it's definitely an appealing thing. Here we have race leader and hometown hero, Michael Versteeg, leaving Whiskey Row, continuing on his journey. Matt, Michael Versteeg is the Coca Dona 250. If you took this race and you turned it into a person, it would be Michael Versteeg. Yeah, I mean, look at this guy. He's just running down the middle of the street as he leaves Whiskey Row like he owns the place, making his way, Rob, to one of the most beautiful sections of the course. called the Dells, or, Dells. yeah, which is right about sunrise when we hit that part. Because I was like, originally my plan, I was like, I figured I'd hit that at night because I thought I'd be farther along. So it was like silver lining was I got that part at sunrise, which is really cool. And it was also a lot easier to navigate over the boulders with the little paint marks uh, during the, during like light. So that was nice. It was a really cool section. As I drift in the deep blue sea Head I now above the surface Taking in that beauty What a sun is shining This is all I need I knew it was going to be really important running through Prescott because those miles going through Prescott you just kind of just click away a lot of road at the beginning um, get, getting as close as I can to Mingus before the heat started coming in the next day. It's fun to run an ultra with no low moments. Like that's, that's always great. But I think at times it's important to experience the low moments. And so you have that to compare to the high moments. And for me, definitely, I had an extended low period of time, I think from Prescott Valley through Fane Ranch and then climbing up Mingus. Tough climb back there. Nice to see some pines again. There's just like so much camaraderie in these like shared misery experiences out there. You know, you hear it all the time like, well, oh, you people are crazy, right? But it's funny because you're running it makes you crazy, but you also thought of it, which makes you kind of... their song, singing of a love for the land and the mighty sea. And I will wash it away in the waves of the eastern bay. I felt pretty good on the climb. Because I figured, okay, it'll be a cruisy downhill, and but it was hot. It was starting to feel really hot, and I was hitting a low. It's in interesting in a race of this magnitude because you just hit parts of the race different than everybody else. You know, one section you're dealing with the heat, and then the next person's dealing with it at night, and it's a totally different section for him. Peter is the fourth runner come through our aid station, so which is really exciting. And it's four o'clock in the afternoon. We are at the Jerome Historical Museum. They've got 8.9 miles left after this aid station. It is all relatively downhill. 
not nearly as technical as what they just went through, they will go into another town. Um, we've got three different people on course helping with crossing streets and things like that for safety. But the big thing coming up in this next section is there's a river crossing that they're for sure going to get wet. It's not the kind that you dance over stones. They're gonna get wet. And so that's really helpful to mention to folks when they come through and they're trying to decide whether or not they're gonna change their shoes or whatever, um, so they can plan accordingly and maybe do that at Dead Horse at the next one. I'm gonna be uh, walking for a little bit. I think we should just get after it right All right, six minutes plus. It was so technical and not in like a it's technical but you can run it if you're if you're good at that it was just you couldn't find footing it didn't matter if you were hanging on your poles or it was crazy what's in front of you um right now i'm just running i feel good i got good energy i've been cranking on this last section and just opening up my stride, which is nice. I'm gonna get back to it. See, when I got to Sedona, that's when I realized that I was told that McKnight dropped. All right, we're getting reports from the field that Michael McKnight is not looking great right now. What's up, everybody? Currently about 40 miles in. I am suffering. There's a 20 mile section, 8,000 feet of climbing where I ran out of water for the final two, two hours. <clears throat> I took five naps in that section. <laughs> That's more naps than I've done in all of my 200 mind. Just because <clears throat> I was blacking out, every little shade I could find, I'd just crawl in there and take a little nap. But I've gotten about four liters of water in me since I got to the station and I'm feeling a lot better. Time to get it going. Yeah, and to put that into perspective, Rob, Michael McKnight is basically the Michael Jordan of 200s. This guy has essentially won every 200 plus mile race in the country up to this point. That's right. That's what everyone keeps asking me about him. And I was like, well, he's obviously like a really experienced guy and knows what he's doing. So it's like, I can't say anything. It's like he he's the guy knows what he's fucking doing, but it's like, but I mean, maybe he's like the best example to use. Like, it's like, these aren't those other races. You can't get away with stuff at this race that you can get away with even at other like 200 mile races. Like Your core temp is too high. Yeah. And so if we can get that down, hopefully we can kind of- Relax and start to feel a bit yeah. more Yeah, maybe you can do it with a rag. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's okay to just say, like, this fucking course beat me today. Like, you know what I mean? Or, or whatever. Like, like I've dropped out of races. Like, I've been unsuccessful in, like, a, a ton of things. And it's, like, it's because I wasn't good enough. And, like, I shouldn't feel, like, insecure about saying that. Like, it's totally fine to, like, get beat by crazy fucking things sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, we don't need to keep coming up with, like, all these excuses. I driving around, I saw 90. 
just an exposed 90, man. It's just, yeah. it's, it's a different kind of 90. No, that's... And it's just really dry and sandy. Yeah, all the above. That was, that was rough. Something that happens in a 250 mile race. That's a lot of chances for something to go wrong. I don't know how I can do a 2500 foot climb. Super, super. Yeah. His arms are Uber Uber. even. I mean, his core temp is pretty warm, noticeably warm. Based on what we're hearing, Matt, it sounds like Michael McKnight's journey here at Cocodona could be coming to an end. I think Sedona, the theme of the day was like, is of course beautiful, but like, let's survive the heat. Let's be smart. Let's carry extra water. Let's really ice ourselves down. And I mean, there's not much hiding from the sun and the heat. And it's not like you can just press on harder to climb up out of it. Where it's you kind of run on the streets and you're like, you think you're almost there and then it's still another mile and another mile and you're like, where are we going? Um, and then I picked up Courtney from there. So we ran the rest of through Sedona t towards, I guess we're going towards Black Tank. Um, so the Sedona trails part was great. Who knew you could get from Sedona to the outskirts of Flagstaff at Fort Tuthill through that route? Like that was, that was pretty awesome. I mean, you use this road that drops off on both sides, climb up over Kasner or whatever, and it's epic. And it's sort of like, man, yeah, some people that will never want to run this race would definitely want to know about that route because it's super cool. Like, I think those are the things that brought in this beyond ultra running and then bring up this same shared sentiment of like protecting public lands and responsible use and just like look the community's way bigger than these 200 fools who want to run 250 miles like there's all sorts of people i think it's that sort of growth potential is epic i think that's that's what's pretty awesome and as the sun sets on day three at Cocodona. We've got our lead runners coming out of the hot, hot conditions of Sedona, making their way up Kasner Mountain onto the Coconino Plateau. This is going to be cooler temperatures and some high elevation above 7,000 feet. Yeah, and as of right now, Michael Versteeg still has a pretty commanding lead on the race. And with the drop of Michael McKnight earlier in the day, uh, we have Dax Hawk running in second and Pete Mortimer, who has been giving chase for the last few hours now uh, is in third. And so we could definitely have a race on our hands, Rob, as we see runners coming into Fort Tuthill, which is also the largest aid station on the course and marks basically the gateway to Flagstaff. Dax was so strong though. He just kept pushing. I kept hearing stories about his feet and how bad they were. And uh, <laughs> we were shuffling along, but I was, I think we were both surprised when I walked in at Tut Hill and I, I looked over and I saw him and kind of locked eyes and it's like, okay, now it's a race. <laughs> so we saw Dax Hawk, our second place runner, come into Fort Tut Hill and now we're getting word that he has to get some medical evaluation uh, in that back room over there. Yeah, Rob, and one of the kind of interesting things about these longer races is that, you know, medical is there to help keep you from yourself. You know, they're going to help make sure that you're safe. Uh, and so hopefully everything is okay with Dax. Hopefully he just needs to get some rest, which is kind of what it looks like medical is wanting him to, him to do. And uh, hopefully he will be back out there and continuing on his journey.
And it looks like Dax is coming out of the medical room now. Oh, and he hits us with a little shimmy shake there, Rob, pulling off those dance moves. And it looks like he's getting ready to exit Fort Tudhill Aid Station and make his way to Walnut Canyon. He left. I, I must have left 10 minutes after him, I think. Um, but knowing that he was within, within reach. Yeah, thanks. I was, I was amped up. My pacer Ryan, he was like a, <laughs> it's like a rabid terrier behind me. He's like, we're gonna get him. We're gonna get him. Just like he has all this, like, you know, uh, emotion, just kind of help fueling me. And, and again, it's you need stuff like that at whatever time it was in the morning on day two or three. <laughs> when I got down to Walnut Canyon now, and I saw a flash of the light and then he saw my light i was like okay now it's go time every i'd see him up on a ridge do it go around a corner i round the corner and like we'd have this long straightaway and just complete darkness and i had the heavy metal blasting my ears and my buddy ryan's behind me just like just you know i trip occasionally he's like you know keep your shit together and and uh finally on the last stretch i saw him and um just ran up next to him and just had a few few words. It was nice. We sat and walked together for a bit, and I was just I I'd run with him several times during the race, and we'd exchange conversations. And uh, he seemed like a really nice guy. And it's after all that time, and especially when you haven't seen anybody for so long, it's <laughs> it's it's nice to see a little bit of humanity out there, you know. Yeah, it's crazy, Rob, that at this point in the race, these two gentlemen are going to be separated by a mere minutes when they leave this aid station. And the race for second place being this tight after 200 plus miles is absolutely insane. It's great to like <laughs> get to 245 miles in and then start climbing Eldon. It's, it's perfect. I thought that was awesome. Wouldn't have it any other way. Love keep running. this race was to add to the story. And it feels good to feel like I finally maybe lived up to my end of the bargain. What a special moment. Michael Versteeg making his way down Beaver Street. He is less than a tenth of the mile to the finish at Heritage Square in downtown Flagstaff. This is just a magical moment for everybody at the Coca Dona 250. Yeah, Rob, what an incredible moment for Michael this uh, arduous journey that has happened over the last few days running through places that he's lived running down whiskey row leading for most of the race to culminate this uh, with a victory has to be really special for Mike like this is that authentic event like this is that brutal like grizzled thing through the desert like that is legit I don't doubt anyone for their capability um, in any distance, in any race. I, I think I, again, starting from a guy that was overweight, just trying to lose some weight and then run a few miles to doing this, it's doable. You just got to put in the time and uh, you definitely have to enjoy it. <laughs> Here she is, Maggie Gatero, your women's champion, making her way to the finish at Heritage Square. What an incredible performance. Give round of applause and make some noise for Maggie Gatero! 
Yeah, and I know that if you try to think of every situation that you could over the next three, four days, there'll be something crazy that you've never thought of, so you just don't even bother. had to because I put everyone else through it, you know? So I had to put myself through it too. And I did. And I, I made it. It's surrounded by so many people that care so much about it that that's what makes it so amazing. And they want it feels like they want no credit, yet they've done so much for it that it's just incredible. Like I didn't know I'd show up here and see this amount of passion around a single event. That's what makes me want to come back. Yeah, our first wave just went out. Our second wave is just ready to go out. The sun's starting to come up. We've got a half moon up in the sky. It's a perfect temp. Really good day. I mean, humans love sports and they love drama and this has it all to like an nth degree and beautiful, amazing landscapes. What more, could you, what more do you want?